Hey guys and welcome back to my channel for another midweek mystery video. Today's case is often reported to be one of Britain's best known missing person cases. But whilst I had heard of this name before, it's not one I can say I particularly knew much about. Jeanette Tate's been missing for coming up to 42 years and is one of England's longest running missing person cases. This was actually a request from one of my wonderful channel members, so thank you so much for the recommendation. My channel members get priority case requests and I'm going to be covering quite a few of them over the next couple of months, so this channel is going to become quite community based I suppose in the coming weeks. This is the story of the disappearance of Jeanette Tate, who vanished on August 19th, 1978, from Aylesbury in Devon. She was 13 years old, about 5 foot tall, with short brunette hair. She's often described as boyish, not really yet hip puberty, but her friends report that she was beginning to develop. Jeanette was born in Taunton, Somerset on the 5th of May 1965 to John and Sheila Tate, their only child before they separated shortly after. John soon remarried and took main custody of Jeanette. They lived together in the small East Devon village of Aylesbury, which was this tiny village that would have had a population of around 500 people at the time. The population was mostly focused down just one road. It was about eight miles east of Exeter and John and Jeanette lived with his new wife Violet and her teenage daughter Tanya. Everyone got on very well. Violet would later say that she never had any memories of Jeanette getting angry or losing a temper or arguing. It was just happy families all around. And Jeanette maintained regular contact with her mum, Sheila, as well. Her family called her Ginny and she was a naturally shy girl, but she was very smart and aware. She enjoyed school and she particularly excelled in maths. She loved animals and writing, writing mostly poetry. As so many children her age did, Jeanette picked up a local paper round to earn some money. She was the relief paper girl at the time. She'd stand in for the main paper boy when he was unable to do his round. She'd been doing this for only about a week when she disappeared whilst on this paper round. August 19th started just like any other day for Jeanette and her family. John left the house at 7.30am to take Violet to work at the hospital in Exeter. By 10am he arrived home to make the girls breakfast and the girls wandered to the post office for some sweets. It was the summer holidays and Tanya was heading off to spend two weeks with her father in Cornwall. So at 12.20pm, John drives Tanya and her boyfriend to Exeter to catch her coach, leaving Jeanette home alone. He asked Jeanette if she wanted to come on the journey, but she declined, saying she had to work. He left his daughter sitting on the front lawn and he would never see her again. Just after 2pm, Jeanette would have left home to start her paper round. She would have to ride her blue bike through the village and along Withen Lane, the only lane which led to the main road, the busy A3052. This was the main road connecting Exeter to the seaside town of Sidmouth, and it likely would have been a very busy road that day, people heading to the beach in the middle of the summer. Jeanette arrives at the White Horse Inn on the A road to collect the bundle of papers from the delivery van, and then she begins her round, delivering papers to houses in the local area, mostly down Withen Lane. By 3.15pm she delivered 14 newspapers and had travelled the majority of the way down Withen Lane. She happens to run into two of her friends on her journey, Margaret Heavey and Tracy Pratt, and they start chatting. Jeanette gets off her bike and walks alongside her friends for a bit, walking back towards Aylesbury with them. But eventually she gets back on her bike and cycles away out of sight, continuing on her paper route. This is the last time anyone would see Jeanette. She was wearing a white t-shirt with her name embroidered in red letters on the left shoulder, light brown trousers and white plimsolls. About seven minutes later, with the girls walking the route behind Jeanette, they discover her bicycle lying in the middle of the road, newspapers scattered around. Confused, they begin to call for her, searching the media area, but she wasn't there, she just disappeared. They make the decision to take Jeanette's bike with them and head to her house, where they speak to John and say that they can't find Jeanette anywhere. Was she at home? But obviously, she wasn't. So John and Violet head back out with the girls to look for her. Several other friends and neighbours also join in on the immediate search. It wasn't long until Violet turned around to John and told them that she thought they'd better call the police. So by 5pm that day, Jeanette Tate had been reported missing. This was the beginning of an almost 42 year missing persons case, the largest and longest investigation ever conducted by the Devon and Cornwall police. The police response was swift and serious. Within just a couple of hours, Aylesbury was filled with 70 uniformed officers and 50 detectives searching on foot, whilst RAF search and rescue helicopters searched from the sky. 
all local residents spent their first evening desperately searching the fields and woodland. Divers searched the local ponds and every gravel pit was searched. Search dogs also joined the team, but not a clue was found apart from the bicycle lying on its side in the lane. The next day, a press conference was held from the makeshift police incident room in Aylesbury Village Hall, where John Tate spoke of his fears his daughter may have been abducted. He said that she was a normal, well-adjusted girl with no reason to run away, something that everyone who knew her confirmed to be true. He spoke directly to his daughter, saying, if you are able to do anything off your own bat, then please telephone us, go to a policeman or even write. To the public, he begged, please keep looking, keep your eyes open and don't give up hope. Jeanette's mum, Sheila, said of the theory that she'd been abducted that Jeanette would not have fallen for the sweeties trick. She was intelligent and knew well enough not to do this. She said, we have never quarreled over Jeanette at all and she comes to see me pretty regularly. Although I can't find evidence in articles of this now, I assume there may have been question over John and Sheila arguing over custody of Jeanette, that maybe one of them abducted her back but it's pretty clear now that this isn't the case. It's also worth noting that John Tate had been asked to account for his own movements at an early stage of the investigation. He wasn't ever a suspect per se, but the police wanted to rule out every single possibility. John, of course, had nothing to do with his daughter's disappearance. He was clearly distraught and he had an airtight alibi. He'd been seen in Exeter dropping Tanya off at the coach station and picking Violet up from work. The two then went shopping and the staff at the local department store clearly remembered John coming in to collect a plate that he'd ordered. It was decided at the very beginning of the investigation that the way to proceed would be with maximum media exposure. The aim was to make Jeanette too hot to handle, to make sure that every single person in the country was keeping an eye out for her, making sure that everyone knew her photo. Of course, there are always pros and cons with taking this approach to any case. Will it make the abductor panic and kill Jeanette quicker? But also, how do they expect to find her when people don't know they should be looking for her? By the next morning, reporters from across the country had descended on Aylesbear. Police repositioned the bike on the lane and invited reporters to take photos and publish in the national papers. The police reconstructed the circumstances surrounding Jeanette's disappearance on the 22nd of August, hoping that it would provide them with more answers. But with so little to go on, it didn't provide much more clarity. It seemed like Jeanette had literally just been snatched off her bike. The Devon and Cornwall police did quickly discount the possibility of Jeanette running away from home, as at the time of her disappearance, she had literally nothing on her besides the clothes she was wearing. And she was in the middle of working as well. Plus, she had no reason to run away. She was a very placid, happy girl. She had a lot of money saved up in her bedroom as well that she'd been saving for an upcoming family holiday that she was really excited about. If she was gonna run away, she'd probably take that money, as well as the money that she'd been collecting for customers on her paper round, which was still in her purse on the bike when it was found, which also ruled out robbery as being the motive behind whatever happened to her. The police explored the possibility of it being a hit and run accident, that somebody driving down the lane hit her by accident and panicked, taking her body and disposing of it but this was ruled out again pretty quickly. Her bike was undamaged and there were no tire marks on the road. Plus her friends really weren't that far behind her and for somebody to hit Jeanette and act that quickly in a panic would be unlikely. Therefore, from just hours into the investigation, the police were working under the assumption that Jeanette had been abducted, which made the first 24 hours of this investigation the most crucial and very difficult when you've got literally zero evidence to go on. All they had was the bike and Tracy Margaret had moved it from the lane, meaning that the only piece of viable evidence had been tampered with. Likelihood is that they wouldn't have found anything even if the bike had been left where it was, but now we'll never know. There was nothing in the investigation for 48 hours, but then it seemed like there was a breakthrough. A woman called Matilda Rogers came forward, saying that her and her 14 year old daughter Gail were on holiday in Devon and been staying at a cottage on Withen Lane. On the day in question, her and Gail were walking down Withen Lane, away from Aylesbear towards their cottage. They came to the police and told them that they'd seen the girls in the lane shortly before Jeanette had disappeared, at the bridge where they'd all happened to run into each other, all three girls together. But they'd also seen a man in a maroon coloured car. The car had been driving along Withen Lane in the direction of the three girls, and would have passed them on the lane close to where Jeanette would soon go missing. This was the most credible information the police had heard yet, and it's possibly, even to this day, still the most credible information the police have about this investigation. 
This was placed at the centre of the police appeal, and the witness even underwent hypnosis to help her recall more details about the car and the man. It was established to have maybe been a Triumph 1300, or another car similar with Finn's, and the driver was described as a young man of smart appearance with dark hair, quite handsome. This is the artist's impression of this man thought to have been driving the maroon car that day. So everything right now matched with the theory that Jeanette had been abducted. The following weekend, Detective Superintendent Rundle, in charge of Jeanette's case, made a public appeal for people to join in the search on Woodbury Common, a huge amount of grassland just outside of Aylesbury. There were so many people searching every single corner of this woodland, but the truth is that by this point, it was days later. If Jeanette had been abducted, which was the angle police were working on, she would likely be nowhere near Woodbury Common. It was a search in vain, just a police attempt to get more media attention. As always happens with missing persons investigations, psychics began to come out of the woodwork offering their help. Strangers arrived on the doorstep of the Tate family home offering their theories, People called the police with the most obscure tips, but of course, nothing brought them any closer to an answer. Despite the craziness they tolerated, hoping that something would slip through the net, there was just nothing. Police amassed more than 20,000 cards in a filing system related to this case. Daily press conferences were held, and the media became desperate for literally any clue. Once Jeanette's story hit the papers, people became rabid for any information they could get their hands on about this case. From what I can gather, the reporting of Jeanette's case was on par with that of Madden McCann's 30 plus years later. Reporters would trespass on the Tate property on a daily basis just to try and get an interview with John. I can't imagine the stress of your daughter going missing, desperately searching for her whilst having the nation looking at you. It definitely seems like somewhat of a double-edged sword. You want the media to be aware, you want people to help, but also... That's very stressful. Police made connections to another young girl who disappeared nine years earlier, April Fab, also aged 13. She disappeared near the village of Melton, which is four miles from the North Norfolk coast. Her bicycle also just left lying in the lane. Just like Jeanette, no trace of April has ever been found. Both girls also disappeared in the school holidays, April disappearing in April. The obvious argument against two cases being linked though, of course, is that they took place on literally the opposite sides of England. Norfolk and Devon are literally nowhere near each other. No solid link between the two cases has ever been found, but the head of the Norfolk police at the time said they were sending Devon a card index containing thousands of names of people interviewed by them at the time. There was also a list of car numbers taken by groups of children near the scene of April's disappearance. All of which was cross-checked by the Devon police to see if anything linked up, but nothing did. Despite the lack of evidence in Jeanette's case, there actually has been a prime suspect in this case for a number of years, since the late 90s. Serial killer Robert Black is someone who I've mentioned in passing a number of times on my channel. If you're talking about a missing child in the UK, you can almost guarantee that Black can be considered a suspect. Maybe at some point soon I'll do a serial killer spotlight on Robert Black that I can link back to whenever I mention him. You may remember that his name actually came up very recently in my video on Mary Boyle. It's thought likely that he could have been responsible for her murder just as he thought to be responsible for Jeanette's. Or maybe he's just a bit of a scapegoat for the police. If you don't know who to pin a child murder on, child disappearance on, Robert Black is a pretty easy option. Robert Black was a Scottish serial killer and rapist. He was one of the worst child killers the UK has ever seen. He was convicted in 1994 of the kidnap, rape, sexual assault and murder of four girls between five and 11 in the 80s in the UK. He was questioned by the Devon and Cornwall police in connection with Jeanette's case, but he was never arrested. Black worked as a long distance delivery van driver in the 70s, which took him to every corner of the UK. He was constantly on the move, including making deliveries in the Exeter area around the time that Jeanette disappeared. Years later, in 1996, an eyewitness claimed to have seen a vehicle of the model that Black was known to have driven back in the 70s at Exeter Airport on the day of Jeanette's disappearance. I always tend to take claims like that with a pinch of salt. I always question things when somebody comes forward with information decades later. How can you suddenly remember something that happened so many years earlier? However, Robert Black was convicted in 1994 and the information about him and his crimes and the kind of car he drove probably didn't come out until around then. So it's not crazy that somebody would come forward with information about Robert Black specifically 
all those years later. However, I do wonder how somebody can specifically remember seeing a specific car in Exeter Airport on the day that Jeanette disappeared. I do question that, but the police seem to take it pretty seriously. Rumour has it that there was also a petrol receipt which puts Black in the southwest around the time of Jeanette's murder, but we don't know exactly how close to Aylesbear this was. As much as the police have tried to establish Black's location on the day that Jeanette disappeared, they've never been entirely successful. They did try to prosecute him for the murder, but the Crown Prosecution Service decided in 2008 there was insufficient evidence to charge him. Robert Black died in prison in January 2016, and at the time, the Devon and Cornwall police were just a number of weeks away from submitting another file to Crown Prosecution Service in which they sought a new decision on whether or not to prosecute him. The file was submitted in the April anyway, but the CPS said that due to the death, there would be no posthumous decision to charge him with Jeanette's murder. It was hoped the CPS would make a clear statement as to whether or not they would have charged him if he was still alive, but they declined to say anything. This would have been just a slither of closure if the CPS thought there was enough evidence that he could have been responsible, then this would be a big thing. But they said they just couldn't make a decision on the file now. Despite the police's insistence that Black was a perpetrator of Jeanette's murder, he never admitted his crimes, and he was always very careful not to implicate him in any more crimes apart from those that he was charged with. Black died without giving anything away, but it is widely thought that he killed many more than the four girls are known. He would have been an experienced killer and an experienced abductor. If he set his sights on abducting Jeanette, he would have done it quickly and swiftly, like a fox snatching its prey. Hi, Edson Georgia here. Like a five second clip corrupted here for some reason, and I'm not about to refilm an entire video for a five second clip, so here's me popping in to say, all I said was that not everyone agrees that Robert Black was the killer of Jeanette, including her own father, John Tate. His last big interview was held in 2018, where he said that his life was coming to an end, and he just wanted to know where Ginny was. He just wanted to be able to give her a Christian burial, and go to his grave knowing that they'd be together again. He never had any closure. John said that he's never been 100% sure that Black was a the perpetrator they were looking for, but he said that he never wanted to accept that Jeanette was dead and needed proof that Black killed her. He actually ended up writing to him in prison, asking to meet him and asked for a confession if he was responsible for Jeanette's abduction and murder, but I'm not sure if John ever got a response. He definitely never got the meeting, at least. John Tate died just last month, April 2020, after a long struggle with his health. He eventually ended up moving to Manchester, but would make the trip down to Devon on the anniversary of Jeanette's death every single year. Jeanette's disappearance, I should say. But eventually his ailing health meant he was unable to do so. John spent more than half his life trying to find his daughter. His final wish was to be able to bury her. I can only hope that he's been reunited with his daughter finally in his death. It's looking unlikely that Jeanette's case will ever be solved at this rate, bar some kind of deathbed confession from the perpetrator. I'm not 100% convinced it was Black, but there's just as good a chance it was him as it could have been anyone else. Now he's dead, we'll probably never know the true extent of his crime. It's clear to me that Jeanette was abducted. The likelihood is that somebody left their home that morning with the intent of taking a young girl, whether they'd intended to take Jeanette specifically or not. The only car seen driving down the lane at that time was the Maroon Triumph, and the driver of that car has never come forward, so it's very likely that this was the man responsible. I can only assume the police did look very carefully at the residents of the local village and came to the conclusion that it was likely somebody who didn't live in the area, but like I said, there was a main A road there, there were loads of people coming to Devon that summer for holidays, as they do every single summer, people coming down to visit the beach. It could have been literally anyone. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you like what I'm doing here, then make sure you click that subscribe button down below. Leave your comments, let me know what other cases you want to hear me talk about, and I will see you in the next one. Bye guys.